a warm welcome, I hope a very warm welcome, to all of you lovers of New York City, history, architecture, politics, and social justice gathered here today to honor and celebrate the life and work of E. Windsor. Here at her former residence, 2 Fifth Avenue. I'm Margaret E. Diamondstein Spielberg. The chair of the Southern Diamonds Preservation Center, a group of individuals committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of history and historic preservation in our city. While each and every one of you are a very significant part of this event, I would like to acknowledge a few of those who in so many ways helped us to get here today. Firstly, a warmest thanks to the owners and residents of this fine building. <laughs> to Ken Ross, board president, and his fellow board members, collaborators all, to Katie O'Connor and her colleagues, and to the many distinguished representatives of the LGBTQ community and the many significant activists and organizations who've come together today to commemorate and celebrate Edie Windsor. Welcome also to our honored guests, Controller Scott Stringer, that is meant in lieu of applause. <laughs> Controller Scott Stringer, Public Advocate Letitia James, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Brigade, State Senator Tom Duane, and to, and to the members of Miss Windsor's family joining us today. A small reminder this event is being videotaped and will be available to the public via YouTube and iTunes as part of the Diamondstein Spielberg video archives housed at the David Rubenstein Library at Duke University. Now for our program. Born Edith Schlein in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Russian Jewish immigrant parents, Edie Windsor received her bachelor's degree from Temple University in 1950. She earned a master's degree in applied mathematics from NYU in 1957, where she started working on the Atomic Energy Commission's UNIVAC computer, which was then located at NYU. On the strength of her work at NYU, she was hired by IBM as a computer programmer in 1955, and where she obtained the highest level technical position, senior system programmer. Working primarily with operating systems and systems architecture. When Windsor left Philadelphia at age 23, she had already divorced Saul Windsor and decided to be herself and to live her life as a lesbian. She met her first wife, clinical psychologist, Dr. Thea Spire, in 1963. And although each was in a relationship at the time, they continued to meet at social events. Eventually, they became a couple. By 1967, Dr. Spire proposed marriage to Edie by giving her a diamond circle pen, and thus began their 40-year engagement. During the 1970s and 80s, as Winston worked at IBM, Spire built a robust practice as a psychologist. She was also a talented cook, and they hosted many dinner parties in New York City, and at their beach house, their Long Island beach house, where each year 
they held an annual Memorial Day party to benefit the East End Gay Organization. In 1975, Windsor left IBM and became a founding president of PC Classics, a consulting firm specializing in software development. She also assisted numerous LGBTQ groups to become computer literate, helping them automate their mail systems and make technical innovations to support their outreach to their membership and community. Two years after Windsor left IBM in 1977, Spire was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. In 2007, when Spire was told she only had a year to live, they married in Toronto, Canada. New York State subsequently recognized the validity of the marriage. However, when Spire died in 2009, Windsor sought to claim the standard federal tax exemptions for surviving spouses. She was barred by the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which defined marriage as a union between a man and a woman, and was required to pay more than half a million dollars in state and federal taxes on Spire's estate, taxes that would not have applied to a heterosexual couple. Brokenhearted from Spire's death, within a few weeks, Windsor had a heart attack. Despite her legal and health setback, she courageously decided to fight. The case of the United States versus Windsor is arguably the most influential legal precedent in the struggle for LGBT marriage equality. ruling, the Supreme Court struck down Section 3 of DOMA, which had excluded gay couples from all the benefits and protections of marriage under federal law. At the heart of their decision was the principle that the dignity of gay people is mandated by the Constitution to be respected equally under the law. Declaring DOMA unconstitutional, the Supreme Court for the very first time recognized the validity of same-sex marriage and affirmed the right to equal protection for all under the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. this victory, during her last few years, Windsor was recognized for her groundbreaking activism. The recipient of numerous awards, she was the Grand Marshal of the 2013 New York City LGBT Pride March, and the runner-up to Pope Francis for 2013 Time Magazine's Person of the Year. She married Judith Payson. He passed away on September 12, 2017, having achieved for us all, in the words of President Obama, and I quote, justice that arrives like a thunderbolt. <laughs> and now to our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker will be Judith Payson Windsor. And warmest thanks to you, Julie. Please come up. Um,
to be here commemorating my late wife, the iconic Edie Windsor. Thank you all for being here. I will be so honored and proud to walk into 2 5th Avenue every day and see Edie's landmark cultural medallion stationed at the very residence where she spent so many years of her life. I would like to thank the Historical Landmark Preservation Center for the inspiration that made the esteemed cultural medallion possible. What a beautiful tribute to honor Edie's life and legacy. A special thank you to all the political officials, the LGBTQ leaders, the lesbian gay with Apple Corps band, Edie's band, yeah. her family, friends, and building residential community for all being here to share in this momentous occasion. You all play a meaningful part of a cohesive community that Edie loved so dearly. This recognition of Edie's activism, tireless commitment to volunteer work, her professional achievements, and, a and the fight for justice and equality would undoubtedly serve as an inspiration for others. Edie would always say, remember, if my work can make a difference, so can yours. Thank you. and Transgender Community Center as its first female executive director in 2009. Previously, she was vice president at the Women's Media Center and the senior director of media programs for the National Gay and Lesbian Alliance, a member of Governor Cuomo's task force and the AIDS epidemic in New York, Testone is also an executive board of the CUNY Institute for Health and Quality and is a member of the Bronx Borough President's LGBT Policy Task Force. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, thank you especially to Judith. It's an honor to be here today to celebrate his lifelong contributions to our country, to New York City, and to the LGBT community. Your dedication to Edie is an inspiration to us all, and it ensures that her life and her legacy will always be celebrated. With today's medallion dedication, the legacy will also be firmly cemented into the fabric of New York City. You know, I always marveled at Edie's endless capacity for love, and she was truly fortunate to have found the same magnitude of love and support in you. Another trademark Edie characteristic was her fierceness in the fight for equality, and she showed us all that we can change the world when we stand up to injustice. For countless years to come, and I think about this often, I was married in September, for countless years to come, LGBTQ couples will walk down the aisle with Edie at their side, guiding them forward with love and support in a way that only she could. And I think Edie would have loved that. And I know that there is no one that loved a party more than Edie. <laughs> so she should be would have wanted to be there. Throughout her life, Edie made a mark on New York City countless times. She was a founding member of the center and never failed to show up to support us in her work when we needed her. She was one of the first to support our capital campaign to purchase our building on West 13th Street in 1983. At the center, Edie volunteered over a span of more than 30 years. She donated her time and coding expertise to modernize our technology systems and infrastructure. And in May of 1985, this is important, she organized, helped organize the first women's dance. 
It was here that Edie and her future wife, Dr. Thea Spire, danced to the disco version of If You Could See Me Now, <laughs> alongside 300 other women. And that is how many of us will always remember her, dancing, laughing, and enjoying life in a way that only she could, with impeccable style and grace. When Thea passed away in 2009, Edie held her memorial at the center, and when she and Robbie sued the United States of America and won, in true Edie fashion, she held her victory press conference in the center's lobby. So when times get tough, and I'm not alone when I say times have been tough for many of us lately, I think of Edie and her refusal to back down. She keeps me going on days when it seems impossible, and I am eternally grateful for that. Edie was an unwaveringly loyal friend to the center, to our community, and she's a friend that I personally treasure. I will miss her every day, and I know that you all do too. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you, Judith, for remembering Edie in a way that would have made her so proud. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Wendy Stark is the executive director of Callan Lord Community Health Center, where she previously worked from 1994 to 2012. In 2012, Wendy left Callan Lord to join the NYU Lutheran Family Health Centers, but in April 2015, Callan Lord Board recruited Wendy back to the position of Executive Director. She is the recipient of an MBA in Healthcare Administration from Baruch Mount Sinai School of Medicine and is currently on the board of the Community Health Center Association of New York State. Wendy? Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to be here, and I think today I'm going to talk about how apropos I think it is for a medallion that has such an everydayness to it that folks will, will walk past and see and notice and feel every day in comparison to what Edie's legacy is. We all know about the big stuff in Edie's legacy, the, the tremendous policy wins, the tremendous support of our LGBTQ community organizations, her pioneering as a woman in technology, and what was perhaps even more important than that is her everyday presence and the light she brought to the people around her, everyone around her, not just the people she knew and warmly embraced and was, was you know, noticeably uh, friends with and knew their names, but also the people that she didn't know. She would come to every Callan Lord event and meet, I believe, everyone in every room and bestow upon them, if nothing but a beautiful smile, the warmth of her excitement and her enthusiasm and her love that just radiated out of her at every moment of every day. And it's that beauty, I think, that's so fitting to be commemorated, again, with the everydayness of something cemented, as Glenda said, into the building. And so I, I am so pleased to be a part of thanking everyone who was involved in making this happen and thinking about how important it is that we are able to remember Edie in this very, one could say, mundane in the best way, kind of way, her everydayness. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of this, everyone, and to do this especially again. writer and AIDS activist, is the founder of the Gay Men's Health Crisis and ACT UP. His screenplays include the Oscar-nominated Women in Love, and his plays include the OV-winning and Pulitzer finalist, The Destiny of Me, and Tony Award-winning 
a normal part, which was adapted into an Emmy Award-winning movie for HBO. His novels are Faggots, which received an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and The American People, A Search for My Heart, the subject of another HBO documentary, Larry Kramer in Love and Anger. He was named a Master American Dramatist by the Ken Laura Pell's Foundation for Theater and was awarded an honorary doctorate from Yale University, which he, his brother, and his two uncles attended. Larry. Speaker of the Council 
making her the first woman and first openly gay speaker, as well as at the time, the highest ranking LGBT official of New York City, in New York City history. She was instrumental in working to see marriage equality pass in the New York State Legislature and has been a national leader in the LGBT and reproductive rights movement. A very warm welcome to Stan Kim. Thank you, Barbara Lee. And um, as Larry Kramer referenced, and I just want to amplify, Barbara Lee is, is a terrific LGBTQ ally, but she is probably the leading LGBTQ ally as it relates to historic preservation and historic recognition of our community. So Barbara Lee, thank you so much for that. I also want to recognize my council colleague, well, my former, always my council colleague, uh, Council Member Danny Drum, who's with us too. And although we will hear from Robbie, as we should, we all know, and Edie knew, it's all about partnerships, so I want to recognize Rachel Levine, uh, Robbie's wife and life partner and strongest advocate out there. I can't thank Judith enough for all of your work supporting and loving Edie. I remember that one funny story, which I won't tell when we were at that event at um, what? And now, oh, the, the Grand Prospect Hall. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Grand Prospect Hall. And there's only, I don't know, Edie could have like I, potato vodka or not wheat vodka. I don't know what's in vodka. And, and so there's a lot of checking by Judith which vodka they had. And then there was little vodkas coming out of pocketbooks. And, <laughs> but everything was covered and it was not the kind of vodka that would have gotten Edie sick, thank God. So. The detail that you want in a partner and a wife. <laughs> but um, on a serious note, Judith, you are, we're so committed to Edie, but now are so committed to making sure future generations know what the struggle was, who were the leaders of the struggle, what she did, and that really, I, I, although I've always marveled at it, it didn't quite dawn on me until today and after the event of the Big Apple Core how hard that work is and how you've taken it on as your life's commitment. So we all thank you for that. There could be no better recognition for Edie than a plaque on where she lived. Because as Barbara Lee and Judith took us through the story of Edith's life, the most important part of Edie's story, in my opinion, is when she decided, as Barbara Lee said, to live as a lesbian. At a time when it was so much harder, not that it's easy now for anyone, but it was significantly harder then. And I still believe that the most courageous thing anyone can do for the LGBTQ movement is to come out and live their lives as an out person wherever they live. And when Edie did that, she actually sent out ripples that would grow and grow and grow to enormous waves that with the help of Robbie and others would crash down like a tsunami on the Supreme Court and could not and would not be denied. So for that, we owe Edie to some degree in our lives and our loves. The other great thing about Edie, because it's really easy, ask me, we can talk later, you don't have the time, how easy it is to get bitter and angry when you're doing this kind of work and how easy, particularly nowadays, it is to you know, just hate your opponents. And Edie had joy. She had joy. She had always a smile, as Larry said, and she had seemingly a bottomless pit of happiness and joy no matter what was going on. And she would nudge me sometimes and tell me to be happier and have more fun. Um, <laughs> often her suggestions were not appropriate for Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the sentiment I very much appreciated significantly. So for the way you have changed our life, for the courageous act of being you, 
into Fifth Avenue for reminding us to have joy even in the face of defeat and especially to have graceful, dignified, fun joy in the face of victory. Edie Windsor, we thank you. We will never forget you. And now this plaque will make sure future generations and Judith's work that they don't forget you either. political strategist, civil rights activist, and public affairs advisor. He wrote the critically acclaimed memoir, Stranger Among Friends, and co-wrote Brave Journeys, Profiles in Gay and Lesbian Courage, which topped the Los Angeles Times bestseller list. And David was an executive producer of the award-winning documentary House on Fire, which highlighted the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African American community. It was written for Time, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. In 2015, Washington College in Maryland awarded him an honorary doctorate for his lifetime advocacy and activism. Please welcome David Nixon. First of all, Christine, I'm glad to follow you. I will follow you anywhere and any time <laughs> into any battle. And Larry Kramer, I still get chills every time I get to see you. And <laughs> honey, that makes two of us. <laughs> we'll fight over what corner my plaque goes in. The Big Apple Band. Edie loved you. Edie loved you. Edie and I would get together at Nixner's Corner and gossip about every and each one of you. And not one of you was safe. We loved it. I loved her so much. But one of the things I want to remind you all, that Edie's activism didn't just begin when she came out. Her and I used to laugh if only we would have been alive and could have gone together to the Sacco and Vincetti rallies. <laughs> she fought for peace. She fought in the civil rights movement. She fought for women's rights. She fought for an environment. She was a person whose very being was not only LGBTQ, but a human being that believed in justice and equality and liberty for all people. And she taught us how to do it with love, and grace, and dignity. I loved her so much as a friend, but most importantly, she never let any of us forget how much she loved us. Thank you very much. Roberta Garagi Kaplan is the founding partner of the law firm Kaplan and Company, one of a handful of women led elite litigation boutiques in the United States. Robbie has been described by the American Bar Association Journal as a specialist in emerging law. The recipient of numerous awards, she has worked with major clients such as Columbia University, Airbnb, Vice Media, and TO. Robbie is a graduate of Harvard University and Columbia Law School, where she also teaches. As you all know so well, Robbie represented E. Windsor in the landmark case of United States versus Windsor. She's a prolific writer 
and is the author of Then Comes Marriage, The United States versus Windsor and the Defeat of Doma, a book published by W.W. W. Norton in 2015, if you're interested in CNN. That book was chosen by the LA Times and Ms. Magazine as one of 2015's top 10 books. Recently, with Tina Chen, Robbie helped to launch Hashtag Time's Up, a new organization that provides legal representation to women who experience sexual harassment. Welcome and thank you, Robbie. said to me was that she didn't have very long left to live. That was more than 10 years ago. But she really, she wasn't kidding. After her spouse, Thea Spire, passed away, he suffered, as you heard probably talk about, from a series of heart attacks, which were diagnosed as broken heart syndrome. Indeed, he asked me and some of the other lawyers on our team to carry her nitroglycerin tablets for her when we attended events just in case. Because of her heart condition, I was completely neurotic about making sure that Lee's case got decided as quickly as possible. And for the people here who know me and I see my teammate James Essex right across from me, I can be pretty neurotic. that he managed to shave off the process, however slight, might be the difference between E looking to see a victory in our case or not. The truth is, despite all my worries, and despite the fact that we all know that E did live to see victory in her case, I never really thought that E would ever die. There are certain people on this planet, and E was surely one of them who seem to have an inner light about them that is stronger and shines brighter than the rest of us. And it's impossible, even now, to imagine that light ever dimming. And it's funny for me to say this here in front of Edie's building. When my beloved grandmother Belle passed away, I would miss her most during the times of day when I would pick up the phone to call her and realize there was no one to call. The exact same thing is true for me and Edie. When I miss Edie most today is when I live up on 12th Street, when I walk past her building here and think to myself, oh, I'm going to go in to see Edie, only to realize that she isn't there to be visited. Representing Edie in court was, of course, a great, great honor. But so was having her become a member of our family. Although our 12, now 12 year old son reads the New York Times front page easily, he nevertheless suffers from severe dyslexia. And as a result, he had to work very, very hard to learn how to read. Before he could do so on his own, he would come over to our apartment and read to him, and I'm not exaggerating, for hours at a time, including each and every single book and the Captain Underpants series, <laughs> which are just what they sound like, about a superhero who wears grease and a cape and fights talking toilets. <laughs> of course, Edie's love was not unrequited. Jacob adored Edie right back. In fact, just a couple of days ago, Rachel and I were going to a funeral of a beloved member of our synagogue. And when we talked to Jacob about the funeral, he said to us, I hope you don't mind. I'm very sorry that this person passed away, but that's not how I feel about Edie passing away. I still miss Edie so much each and every day. Events about Edie always seem to be timed around the Jewish holiday of Passover. Um, this year, our family celebrated the first Passover in many years without Edie. And just last week, our son celebrated his first birthday party without an enormous pile of presents wrapped perfectly from Edie for him. 
two nights before my argument at the Supreme Court in 2013 was Passover. And we celebrated it all together in a 64-person Seder, believe it or not, in a conference room at the Mandarin Oriental organized by my wonderful, incredible wife, Rachel. Reading together from Rachel's very, very feminist Tagata, <laughs> we told the story of how Moses led the Jewish people from bondage in Egypt to freedom. I'm sure everyone here knows that although Moses was for sure the single greatest prophet in the Jewish tradition, God denied him the opportunity to ever enter the promised land before he died. I actually find this story to be one of the most heartbreaking stories in the entire Bible. Even Moses, who managed to liberate the Jews from Pharaoh and lead them to Israel, all the while making them into a free people over 40 years, even Moses couldn't enter the promised land? Are you kidding me? Really? In order to make myself feel better about it, I try to think of this story as a way of saying that no human being ever gets to complete the work of liberation. In other words, if anyone dies with a sense that their work is complete, then we know that that person has not aimed high enough. Edie saw in her lifetime the once impossible dream of marriage that she and Thea shared for four decades when they got engaged back in 1967 become a reality for gay and lesbian couples here today and across the nation, and I would say today across the world. In fact, Edie, as we know, had a huge role in making that happen. And Edie rightfully exercised that right again with her beloved Judith Kaysen. But although she lived to be 88, many years past the point she told me she would, or her doctors expected, Edie has now left it to us to take the next steps to repair the world. Edie did not view her work as finished after we won in the United States v. Windsor, and neither should we. I would respectfully submit, I know I'm not in court today, but I would respectfully submit to you that the single best way to honor Edie's memory is to redouble our efforts to resist any undoing of the progress that we have made together as a community and a nation. Like you, in a time when our Constitution is under attack every single minute of every single day, we need to keep fighting to make sure that we continue the work done by Edie and so many others, like Larry Kramer and others, from generation to generation until the true promise of this great nation and our beloved Constitution truly becomes a reality. Thank you so much.
It was as if I had known her for a very long time, but in fact, I had just met her. But through that simple gesture, through that simple gesture of steadying her shaking hand, I knew that our struggles were not united. And you see, as, as an African-American woman, Edie marched for my rights, and it was therefore incumbent upon me to march and to lend my voice in support of the LGBTQ community. And so I want to thank Judith for sacrificing her to all of us, because this cause was obviously bigger than the Edie and bigger than the LGBT community. This cause was a cause of righteousness for all communities, all marginalized communities who are struggling each and every day. And you see, Edie was a, a force, a force of nature. And although she was small in stature, and I am obviously bigger in stature, <laughs> she was a giant in so many ways, and I felt so little in her presence. And she, in her crusade for the equal rights, for so many individuals in our country, and she didn't intend to create a movement like so many history makers. She was a reluctant icon, but nonetheless an icon. And she simply wanted uh, to be able to care for her long-term partner, just like millions of other Americans. But her battle struck a chord with countless other couples. The two had faced similar fear and challenges simply because of who they loved. And while Edie was not a combative or aggressive person, she knew that that was unacceptable and she, she would not tolerate it. And so with her great lawyer and her friend, Robbie Kaplan, and Robbie knew, like I know, that the law should be used as an instrument for change. And I thank Robbie for continuing to stand up for justice in the courts and for recognizing that our courts are our greatest pillar and our firmest pillar in our government particularly now, yeah. and I thank you, Robbie. You see, Eddie sought off uh, to change our country forever, and because of her unwavering fight and commitment to equality, we finally saw decades of discrimination and exclusion end in the eyes of the law, and we saw millions of Americans finally have the right to marry and support the, the people they loved. And as someone who stands before you who has tasted and seen hate too many times in her life, it's really critically important that we all come together and recognize the power of love. And so today, once again, we thank and we honor Edie for the mountains she moved and for the fact that she charted a course of history and triumph and for an inspiration, an icon of civil and human rights and for all individuals to understand and to appreciate and to recognize and to honor. And so with this dedication, we ensure that Americans for generations to come will remember the life and legacy of this trailblazer and the millions of lives she touched. Thank you, Edie. officials who would either plan to come today or they hope to be present in some way, um, including Governor Cuomo, who has worked to restore New York's reputation as the progressive capital of the nation. He passed the Marriage Equality Act in 2011 and became the first executive in the nation to issue a statewide to issue statewide regulations prohibiting discrimination on the basis of gender identity, transgender status, and gender dysphoria. He's also set forth a plan to end the AIDS epidemic in New York State by 2020. He hoped to be with us today, and he sent a letter, a long letter, and we appreciate that. There is also a letter Another more lengthy letter from Mayor de Blasio, and we appreciate that. Deborah Blake sent the letter, and 
and the event to see right. So thank you all for being here in spirit, if not in person. And thanks to each and all of you for joining us today, for celebrating the life and work of Edie Windsor here where history happened. I wish you in the words of everyone, in fact, on behalf of Edie Windsor, a life of joy and happiness. In fact, it is the recurring phrase of the day, and one I hope that you will all remember. I would like now to dedicate this sculptural medallion and ask Deborah Gershad, the executive director of the Stark Landmarks Preservation Center, to unveil the plaque and ask Judith Case and Windsor to read the cultural medallion. Before I read the plaque, I'd like to introduce you to Sunny Freeman, which is Edie's cousin. <laughs> Robbie Kaplan with me, and of course, one of me and Dave's closest friends, Karen Sauvignon. Born in Philadelphia, Edie Windsor moved to New York City as a young lesbian in the 1950s in order to be gay. In 1957, she received a master's in applied mathematics from NYU and was hired by IBM as a software programmer, where she reached the highest level technical position. She met a psychologist, Dr. Thea Spire, in 1963, and in 1967, Spire proposed. Unable to legally marry, they were ultimately married in Toronto in 2007. Upon Spire's death in 2009, Windsor sought to claim the standard federal tax exemption for surviving spouses, but was prevented from doing so by the Defense of Marriage Act, which barred the federal government from recognizing marriages between same-sex couples. Windsor then filed the case of the United States versus Windsor in its landmark 2013 ruling. The Supreme Court declared this section, the relevant section of Delmont to be unconstitutional. Recognizing the equal dignity, dignity of lesbian and gay couples and leading to marriage equality nationwide. In 2016, she married a surviving spouse, Judith Kingston Windsor. Thank you, Judith. Thanks to each and all of you. Thanks to the wonderful Big Apple Band. Thanks to the police department. Thank you, police department, for your help. Thank you all for joining us. Until we meet again. <laughs>